In this question, we're told to take G as 10, as usual. A suitcase of mass 20 kilograms moves at a constant speed along a rough horizontal floor when pulled by a horizontal strap with a force of 100 newtons, as shown in figure 1. First thing we have to do is copy figure 1 and mark on our diagram all the forces acting on the suitcase. And then secondly, to find the coefficient of friction between the suitcase and the floor. So let's draw the floor and the suitcase, just as the usual block. We have 100 newtons, which is our forward force. The floor is rough, so we'll have our friction in the opposite direction. And we have our weight, so it's 20 kilograms for the mass, so therefore we have 20 g acting downwards. And then we always have our normal reaction. So there's the four forces acting. We have to find the coefficient of friction in part two. So let's just label that as part one and then part two. Now you'll notice that in the question it says it's moving at a constant speed, a constant speed. So therefore there's no acceleration and the forces are balanced. So as always, we'll resolve in our two directions. So the normal reaction is the only upward force and that will be balanced by the 20 g or the 200 newtons down the way, and then resolving horizontally. Again, the forces are balanced because there's a constant speed, there's no acceleration, and so 100 to the right will be equal to the friction to the left. And then, of course, as always, when we have a rough floor, we're going to be using F equals mu times R, or if you like, FR equals mu times R. So we have three unknowns in our three equations, so therefore we have enough information in order to solve them. So we know that the friction is mu times r, so the friction is 100. So 100 then will be equal to mu times r, and from the first equation there, r is 200. So therefore 100 divided by 200, which is a half, is equal to mu. And that's part two of the question complete. When we read part three of the same question, it says the strap is now inclined at an angle of 20 degrees. So we have what I call a catastrophe. We have a different phase in the calculations, a different phase in what's happening to the block or to the box. So the strap is now inclined. We have a new diagram, as it's shown, and we're asked in part three to find the least force in the strap now required to move the suitcase, giving your answer correct two decimal places. And you see I've underlined that here just to remind me. So we have a different inclination. So we need a new diagram. And new, new forces always lead to new diagrams. So again, if I reduce the size, so we have space for our diagrams. We have the floor. We have the box. We have now this strap inclined. So I'm going to call the force in the strap T. It's not equal to 100 because it's changed. We still have our normal reaction, we still have our weight, 20 g, and we still have friction. So really the only thing that's going to be the same in this part of the question, part 3, the only thing that's going to be the same as it was in the earlier parts 1 and 2 is the fact that the coefficient of friction is a half. So the roughness between the box and the plane isn't changing, but everything else is going to change. So we've got to do our normal procedures are all over again. We can't use the value of R that we had before, so R is going to change. We can't use the value of the friction that we had before, and all that is because our forward force, T, is acting at an angle, so it's going to have a component to the right, and it's also going to have a component. So we need to put our angle on the diagram as usual, so we've got 20 degrees between the force T and the horizontal. And let's just read what it says in the question before we start looking at our equations. So we're asked in the question to find the least force in the strap now required to move the suitcase. So at the moment it's sitting, just sitting there, and we want to find what force needs to be applied in order for the suitcase to begin to move to the right. So really what we have here is what we call limiting equilibrium. Limiting equilibrium. So we're going to have our forces balanced, but we can also apply F equals mu R. So it's not moving, but the friction is still at its maximum. 
So we're going to resolve horizontally, we're going to resolve vertically, and we're going to use F equals mu R. So let's just start with that one, because we have limiting equilibrium, so the friction will be equal to mu, and we know that mu is still a half, so the friction will be equal to a half of R. Now, as I said before, the friction and R are not going to be the same, because our forces have changed. We have a completely new situation. So our second equation, then, we're going to resolve vertically. And it really doesn't matter whether you go horizontally first or vertically first. So let's just take vertical now. So we have R, as always, up the way. But notice that T is also going to have a component up the way. T is going to have a component upwards as well as to the right. And it's this upwards one that we often get wrong. We just assume that R is going to be balanced by the weight. But because T is acting at an angle, it's going to have a component to the right as well as upwards. So therefore, R upwards will have to have T sine 20 added on to it. And that's going to be balanced by the 20G or the 200 down the way. So there's a very important equation. Let's just put that in a box. And then thirdly, we're going to resolve horizontally. So resolving horizontally, our forces are balanced because it's in the limiting equilibrium that we mentioned earlier on. Equilibrium forces to the right are balanced by forces to the left. So going to the right then, we're going to have T cos 20. Remember we had sine 20 there in the last one, so therefore it has to be cosine for the perpendicular direction. So T cos 20 to the right will be equal to the friction to the left. And there's our third equation. So we have three equations in three unknowns and we should be able to solve them. Now I'll just reduce the size so that we can fill in the rest of the solution on the same slide. So let's label our equations 1, 2 and 3. And remember what it is we're trying to work out. We're asked to find the least force, what I've highlighted in the question just up there. It's the least force, so it's T that we're trying to find. We're not interested in the value for R, not interested in the value for the friction. It's just the value for T that we're looking for. So what we want to do is be able to replace R in our second equation so that we just have T as the only unknown. And we've got T in here as well. So if we can replace friction, then we're going to be able to combine number one and number three and then use those in number two. Okay, so the friction from number one is half of R. So let's put that into number three then. So number three is going to give us T cos 20 is equal to a half of R. So 2T cos 20 degrees will be equal to R. And then we can sub that into number 2. So number 2 then, just write it over here, get it all to fit in. So for number 2, R is 2T cos 20 degrees. And then we're adding on from the equation. So we've filled in R, now we're adding on T sine 20 and putting it equal to 200 so t, 2t cos 20 plus t sine 20 is equal to 200. So now the only unknown is t. t appears in two terms, and you'll remember that to work out its value we need to factorise. So taking t outside a bracket, 2 cos 20 plus the sine of 20 will be equal to 200. And so a division at the end gives us our value for t. So 200 divided by our bracket... 2 cos 20 plus the sine of 20 and there we have it and when you work that out to the two decimal places it gives us 90.03 newtons as our final answer.